just after my senior year. Uh, it was 2006, uh, the summer of, I was heading to uh, my freshman year at Rutgers University. Uh, I was a biotech student, and up until this point in my life, I had checked every box that I was supposed to check. Uh, I took the classes that I was supposed to take, um, I got the grades that I, I was told I had to get, uh, I did well enough on my SAT scores to account for the grades uh, that I didn't do so well in. Um, and people had a lot of high expectations for me on what I would do in college and what I, got, what I would do when I got out of college. And if you looked at me from the outside, I looked a lot like my classmates, right? I was super excited to move to this new city. I was pumped to be away from my parents for the first time. I was anxious to make new friends. And from the outside, I looked like just any other student starting at Rutgers University. Uh, but I brought with me a secret. Uh, I had an addiction of prescription opiates. My experimentation with alcohol and marijuana had progressed to this thing that I felt like was so much more innocuous, right? I, um, I found them in people's medicine cabinets. I got my first ever opiates from a doctor. I thought that they couldn't be as dangerous, they couldn't be as bad as some of the other things that I was doing when I was in high school. Um, but that physical dependency that I got to them, you know, I brought that with me to college. And so when all my other friends would be talking about what frat are we going to, who are we going to meet up with tonight, um, I couldn't participate in any of that. Because that physical addiction had completely taken over my mind, body, and spirit. I would sit in my room by myself, and I would sweat. My muscles would ache. If you've ever had the feeling that from the flu, when you are freezing cold but you cannot stop sweating, that's how I would feel every single day, unless I had more of that medication. And so while everybody else was out living their college life, 
My singular focus became, how do I avoid the pain of that withdrawal? And, you know, over my first few months in college, that became more important than my friends. It became more important than my family. It became more important than my future. That pain of that withdrawal became the only thing that I could see. And I remember someone saw me in that pain. And they said, dude, you know you can go get heroin in New Brunswick, and that'll make that pain, that withdrawal, go away. And I got to tell you, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, Monmouth County, like 15 minutes from Great Adventure. I went to a nice high school like this one. I got a good education. I came up in a nice neighborhood. I never thought that that would ever be my path, that I'd ever see heroin, let alone do it. But I found myself in this situation where I was desperate. I was in a ton of pain, desperate to make that pain go away. And in that uh, despair, I would have tried anything to find relief from that withdrawal. And so I made that jump that I never thought I would make. And that addiction tore my life apart within a year. And I start there at the end, because when we talk about mental health, that story of crisis, that story of a bottom, is oftentimes the only story we hear. When we know somebody who struggles with drug and alcohol addiction, when someone struggles with a mental health crisis, we, we hear about when they get hospitalized, we hear about when they get taken out of school, we see those stories of people hitting their bottom. But for me, that was not the whole story. There was not one big decision that brought me to that place in my life. It was a thousand tiny little steps that I think started as early as grade school that put me on a path to bring me to a place where I was never supposed to end up. And so today I know that addiction and mental health diagnoses don't discriminate. Didn't matter what high school I went to, what my last name was, what friends I hung out with. All of these things in and of themselves um, could contribute but did not decide and cannot protect me from ending up doing the things uh, that I did and struggling with the things that I struggled with. And so my, my objective today is to share with you guys that whole journey, the thousand steps I took to the bottom, the thousand steps I had to take back out so that you uh, can have a better idea of what that path looked like so that if you or someone you know happens to find yourself on that path, you don't have to make all the same decisions that I did and you can be empowered to help support yourself or someone else to take a different direction. And the reason that I'm gonna share stuff personally is because I need you to know that if you can relate with what I talk about, that you are not alone. Because I spent years of my life thinking that I was the only one in the world that struggled with the pain that I struggled with. And today I know that is wholly untrue. That statistically, one in four people here have struggled, are struggling, will struggle with a mental health disorder, know exactly what I'm talking about. Which means that there's hundreds of people in this room who uh, know exactly the feelings that I struggle with and the thoughts that uh, took my life over. And so I'm not alone in this room. And I need you to know that you're, you're not alone. But to the three and four that sit with, the, with those people, that you can be the one that changes the way you talk about mental health in your friend groups, in your classes. You can be a support for someone who thinks that no, one is, no one's there for them. And that one person could have been life-changing for me. Um, and so I'm here and I'm gonna get vulnerable and share some stuff that's not easy to talk about so that I can encourage you to be that person for someone else. Because for me, it didn't start with mental, uh, it didn't start with drugs and alcohol. My struggle started way before I even, uh, that was even on my radar. I know today that I struggle with an anxiety disorder. I don't know if I was born with it, but for as long as I can remember, I struggled with it. Some of my earliest memories are that of panic attacks. Getting my name called in class and um, feeling that anxiety overwhelming. The pressure being so great that it would paralyze me. That knot in the back of my throat would get so big that I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I would just sit there in silence until my teacher called on someone else. And I knew that was strange. And my classmates thought it was strange. And I would take all that guilt and all that shame for being different. I would take that home with me. And the anxiety when I was home would latch on to these passing thoughts, right? Things that everyone in here thinks about. My homework done, what my friends are doing outside. I would start to obsess about those things. And the anxiety I would feel 
from those obsessions would be so overwhelming that it would keep me from eating dinner and it would keep me from falling asleep. And there were mornings where I would get up to go to school and realize I had to go do that all over again. I had to go face all those people and I was exhausted and I was hungry and I was anxious and stressed out and overwhelmed to the point where I would have to like vomit before I would go to school. And that's how I know I have an anxiety disorder, right? My anxiety might feel a lot like your anxiety but because of how I feel it and when I feel it, it kept me from making the friends the way that I wanted to. It kept me from eating and sleeping the way that I wanted to. It kept me from learning the way that I wanted to. And so I clearly needed help. I not only needed help, I deserved help. And there was help in every school that I've ever been to, just like there is in this school. But there was also stigma in every school that I've ever been to. And when I started working for Mind in Your Mind, their mission statement was to reduce the stigma around mental health and young people. And I gotta be honest, uh, I knew, I'd heard that word before, I knew it was negative, um, but I wasn't 100% sure what it meant. So I wanna check in with the room real quick. How many people have heard the word stigma before? All right, who's gonna define it for me? No one ever does, right? It is a hard word to define, I get it. So I remember, I didn't know what it meant, and I felt like if I was gonna work with this organization, I better know what the mission statement means. So I Googled it, and I never forgot Google's definition. Google defines stigma as a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. And when I read those first four words, that hit home for me. Mark of disgrace, that is exactly how I felt about my struggle with mental health. All those synonyms I related with, it was something I was ashamed of, humiliated over, disgraced by. And this feeling was in such stark, stark contrast to how I saw people deal with their mental, uh, physical health. Um, you know, I played sports when I was younger, and if somebody got a broken bone, they would get a cast, and we all knew what that cast meant. That that bone is broken, and that person needs that support to heal. A, a doctor told them that. Nobody challenged it, nobody questioned it. And we'd carry their books for them, and we'd hold doors open for them, and we'd sign that cast to let them know that I'm here for you until you get well. But when it came to my mental health, the situation was very similar, except I don't have any casts, and I don't have any scars, and I don't have any way for you to know what I struggle with unless I feel like it's safe to tell you. And because of stigma, it did not feel like it was safe to talk to people about the things that I'm struggling with. So again, I'm sharing this experience with you for the sole purpose of being one example of someone who thinks that it's safe to share this stuff. Because I know today that sharing this stuff and getting the help that I deserve uh, gave me the life that people promised. And I'm gonna talk about that one day, but uh, I'm gonna talk about that later. But in grade school, I didn't feel that way. And the hardest part about stigma for me is I want you, uh, to put yourself in my shoes, right? Second grade, I don't have words to talk about what I'm going through. I know today that what I was experiencing was a panic attack. I know today that obsessions uh, is part of an anxiety disorder and that an anxiety disorder is a treatable condition. I have words and tools to deal with the things that I face every day. But at the time, I didn't have those words. All I knew is I went to school and everybody else got it. It was like you got a book on life, and everybody else knew how to make friends, and participate in class, and life just looked like it made sense, and it was easy to everyone else that I looked at. And it was so hard for me, and I could not understand why. I didn't understand why I had to be the one that was different, and I hated that part of me. I hated the fact that I was different when I didn't think that anyone else in the world was. And I carried that self-hate around for years, and it led me to making a decision that I'm not gonna let anybody see that part of me, that I'm gonna put on this mask, and I'm gonna be exactly who everybody else wants me to be. And if I can wear that mask well enough for long enough, one day I'll wake up and I'll be the person that I'm pretending to be. Because that's the way we talk about mental health. We tell people it's a phase, we tell people they can get over it. And I wanted so desperately for those things to be true. But my anxiety was just as real as a broken bone. And if I didn't go get real help for it, not only was it not gonna get better, it was only gonna get worse. And so, um, so I carried that mask for years. I got a lot of practice wearing it. I moved a couple times when I was younger, different schools, different neighborhoods, different teachers. Every couple years I got another try 
at showing people who I wanted them to see, and I got farther and farther away from that kid in grade school that people made fun of. And people started to believe it. In eighth grade, uh, I'd wake up and my coach would think I'm a good coach, and my parents would think I'm a good son, and my friends thought I was a good friend, and I didn't feel like I was any of those things. And the stress of being two people was overwhelming. And I like to think of it like this. It's like we all got this backpack that we wear that we carry all our stuff around in, and nobody gets to see it unless we tell them about it. And so when we go home and our parents are fighting, we take all that stress and we put it in the bag. When we get, uh, you know, go through a breakup or we don't, you know, we get a college rejection letter, we take all that and we put it in the bag. And we carry all that stuff around with us every second of every day. And some days that bag gets really, really heavy. And that's not a big deal if you're sharing that weight with other people. If you're letting people know about it and you're not the only one carrying it, then it doesn't feel so heavy. But I wasn't doing that with anyone. I had um, more stress than most. I had all that anxiety. Um, I had all my, the shame that I felt around it. And I had no ways to take any of that pressure off my shoulders. And so this started to lead me to making some decisions that brought me down that path that I didn't think I'd ever go down. Uh, I started to use negative coping skills as a way to deal with that stress in the moment uh, by myself. And for me, even before it, uh, it, was, it became alcohol, it was anger. Anger was my first experience with a negative coping skill. I remember in eighth grade, I would just rage. I would get in fights, um, I, you know, get sent out of the principal's office. I would burn at my teachers or slam lockers or I'd punch holes in walls when I was home. And in those moments when I was angry, the only thing that I could feel was that anger. And I know everybody in here can relate with that feeling when you've just been so pissed off at something that the only thing that you can even, your whole world becomes that one thing. Um, and to me, who had carried that stress, that anxiety, that pain every second, every day, when I would get angry, I wouldn't feel that stress. I wouldn't feel that anxiety. I only felt the anger. And that felt like a reprieve to me. And at the time, I couldn't comprehend that my anger was developing more consequences than it solved. But that reprieve was intoxicating because it was the only time I had ever not felt that weight on my shoulders. And so I did it more. And I did it more. But every time I would take those feelings and I would put them in the corner when I would calm down, all those problems, all that anxiety, all that stress, all that was still there. And it had piled on top of all the things that I got, the consequences from my anger. And as that pile got bigger, I would just get more angry. And it started to set me into this cycle where things were only going to get worse for me because I wasn't dealing with that thing on the bottom of the pile. And when I got to high school, it progressed, right? Started hanging out with a group of kids that were older, they went to parties, they drank, and I thought, hey, if I do what they do, uh, nobody's gonna question this mask that I wear. And so I would hang out with them, and everybody would drink, and I was petrified of alcohol. My parents are uh, you know, recovering alcoholics, and they said that it's in my genes, that it's uh, genetically, if I pick up drugs, if I pick up alcohol, that I'd end up in rehab, I'd end up in jail, that I'd end up like them. And you know, for all the fighting that went on in my house, all the times we moved, when I was younger, I didn't want to be anything like my parents. And so I was legitimately afraid of alcohol because I didn't want to be like them. But over time, that fear of the consequences gets smaller, that fear of not fitting in gets bigger. I just, I got curious, I wanted to see what everyone else was doing, I wanted to see what this thing was all about. And so I started to drink. And alcohol became a problem for me so, so quickly. Uh, because it replaced anger. I thought, hey, when I go to these parties, when I hang out with these kids, this is how I'll hang out. This is how I'll have fun. This is how I'll relax. And so I would do the same thing that I did with anger. I would take that feeling, right? I had these underlying feelings that I needed help for. And I would put it in the corner for a moment or for a night. And when I would wake up, all those feelings were still there. And they had stacked on top of all the other things that had come from my drinking and my anger. And as that pile grew, my use got worse and worse and worse because it took more alcohol and more marijuana or like whatever I could put in that mix to put that in the corner for a moment or a night. 
And so this is the problem I know today with all these negative coping skills that I use for the next decade of my life. That um, what I needed were tools to deal with my anxiety. What I needed were ways to deal with stress. What I needed were ways to work on the self-talk, that voice that runs in my head that was so mean to me. Like when I looked in the mirror, I didn't say nice things to myself. Uh, I wanted to like the person that I was a little bit more. Those are the things that I needed if I wanted to be truly successful and felt and feel well. But instead, I would try to avoid them for a moment or for a night to find these little reprieves that didn't help with any of the problems, they just added to them. And it sent me onto this cycle that brought me to places that I didn't understand I could end up in. Because the truth is that I would look at people who were addicted to drugs and living on the street when I was younger and go, what happened? Why would that person make that decision? Why would someone throw away their future, their family, a career, like their house, to go get high or drunk? It did not make sense to me why someone would make a decision like that. But today I know that that's not one decision that any one person made. That it was a series of tiny little decisions and when I started making these decisions around negative coping skills, it sent me into that downward spiral. Because as that pile grew, I would need to use more. And as I would use more, it would add more to the pile. And I would only ever take steps farther away from feeling better. And I would never take any steps that would get closer until I tried something different. But to me, dealing with this problem all by myself, I thought this was the best thing I had going, and if I kept looking, I'd find something that worked. And so that progression led me to, uh, you know, junior year when I started to do experiment with these prescription medications that I saw in people's medicine cabinets. I had been prescribed my first prescription from a, a dentist. I got a oral infection after I got my wisdom teeth out. And so that was the first time I tried it, and then I realized it was in people's medicine cabinets. We get them from pharmacies. This can't be as dangerous as the alcohol that had sent me to the hospital the year before. But I know today that there's a reason that doctors go to school for eight years to be able to prescribe this stuff. And just because it's safe for you to take doesn't mean that it's safe for me to take. Um, I, uh, I remember in junior year, I started to take it more regularly and things changed. Up until this point, I was definitely mentally dependent. I needed drugs, I needed like marijuana, I needed alcohol, I needed prescription medication to make it through my week. It was something that I did every weekend and maybe a couple nights a week. It was something that mentally I could not handle life without. But I wasn't physically addicted yet. And in junior year, I crossed that line of physical addiction. I would wake up in the morning and at first it just felt like I was coming down with something. Chest would hurt a little, muscles would hurt a little. Um, I would have the sniffles, and I would just feel a little sick. Take the medication, you know, get high that day, wouldn't feel it anymore. And every single day that sickness got a little worse, and a little worse, and a little worse. So I was waking up in senior year, and it was like I had the flu. Like freezing cold, shaking, nose running, like terrible feeling every single morning. And then I'd take that medication, and I would, the feeling would go away. And that physical withdrawal, was the way that drugs reprogrammed my brain to make them a priority. Where I lost the ability, once I crossed that line of physical addiction, to make an informed decision around drugs and alcohol. People would say to me, why are you doing this? This stuff is bad for you. And I could not understand that question. I could not hear what they were saying because to me, they became like food and water. That addiction had reprogrammed my brain so that when someone said, why do you do this? It was like someone saying, why do you drink water every day? And it's like, because if I don't, I feel like I'm gonna die. And that is how, that is the trick that was played where I couldn't make an informed decision anymore. And it became the most important thing in my life because I did not want to feel the pain of that withdrawal. And so I, that, I, I brought that with me into college. I thought, new city, new people, fresh start. I'm not going to do this stuff anymore. But I brought all that shame. I brought all the anxiety. I brought all the physical addiction with me. And I still didn't have a choice. And so when I made that jump to heroin, it changed my life. 
got me kicked out of school, it got me kicked out of my house. I spent a year of my life living on the streets in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I ate outside, I slept in kitchens. Uh, I mean, uh, in soup, I slept outside, I ate in soup kitchens. Uh, I got arrested for the things I did around my addiction. All those things that I thought I would never do, that became me. And a lot of people would say like homelessness is not a bottom for you, like, like a jail is not a bottom for you. And I wanna talk a little bit about this, this idea of a bottom. Listen, as human beings, we all need to go through some pain before we, we're willing to change. We don't, we don't you know, change things when it's meant, right? Like, I'm sure if you've all been through like a breakup, like when things are okay, you just deal with it. Um, it usually there's a blowout. There's something huge that happens that makes you actually wanna make a change in your life. And it's the same issue with drugs and alcohol, but the truth is that you choose what that catalyst is. There's no amount of consequences, there's no amount of pain that is a prerequisite to you getting help and feeling better. And for me, jail and homelessness were not a bottom. They were uh, terrible experiences, but my bottom uh, came a little bit later. Uh, I was working at this job where I tried to move home. My parents let me move home, but uh, I was still using, so they were, they were kicking me back out. And uh, I had a, to wear a suit and tie to work every day. And I needed this job to financially support my habit. My habit was very expensive. I didn't, I didn't have the money to support it. I would go through the withdrawal, and that was unacceptable. And so I would walk to work in the morning, and I would iron my clothes in the electric hand dryer, using the hot air to get the wrinkles out. And I would just be dressed ready to go when everyone else got there. And at this point in my life, I had 20 years of experience of convincing everyone on the outside that I am fine when I am falling apart on the inside. And as long as I had the drugs I needed to physically make it through that day, for better or for worse, my coworkers believed that charade. And no one in the world knew how scared I felt uh, that I didn't know where I was gonna sleep that night and how alone that I felt that no one else in the world knew how much pain I was in except me. And every single day that I woke up, it felt a little bit worse and I didn't know how much longer I could bear it. And I remember uh, that that loneliness was a bottom for me. Jail was a terrible experience. I don't ever plan on getting arrested again, but I wasn't the only person in the cell that knew what it felt like to hear a door click shut and know that you cannot leave until someone else out there hits that button. And soup kitchens, uh, you know, I'm not the only person in that room that knew what it was like to be hungry. So as painful as that experience was, I didn't feel totally alone there. But at this job, I had no friends. I pushed my family away. The only people I interacted with were these people at work, and they believed that lie I told. And the loneliness of being the only one in the world who knew how much pain I was in was unbearable. And I remember uh, buying all the drugs I could afford and making myself a promise that if I wake up tomorrow, I'm gonna go get help. But I had no plans on waking up that next morning. I had no desire to die. I had a desire to end my pain. And in that situation, all alone, all by myself, I didn't think that things could ever get any better because every single day of my life uh, was the worst day of my life at that point. And what I really needed was for one person to let me know that simple message that today might suck, but tomorrow can be better. And I'm so, so grateful that I got the opportunity to learn that because I did wake up the next morning. In a bad way, close to overdose, I needed to get hospitalized. From that hospital, I went to a rehab. And in that rehab, they said, you gotta go see a therapist. And I was like, no. I thought only mentally ill people want to go see a therapist. Today, I know that is not true. That anyone is allowed to go talk to a therapist. If you have a mental health diagnosis, like I do, your therapist can give you targeted treatment to help with that diagnosis. My, um, my anxiety was like a respiratory infection. I needed specific targeted treatment to be able to deal with it. And I got that from a therapist. But anxiety doesn't run my life anymore. The kid that couldn't speak in second grade gets up in front of strangers and I'll answer whatever questions you have in a few minutes. Anxiety is part of my life, but I've been given the tools to, to be in control of it. It doesn't define me anymore. What I do talk to my therapist about is things that everybody in this room goes through. We don't even talk about my diagnosis. We talk about my relationships. We talk about my future. We talk about how to work on that self-talk so that uh, 
I'm not so hard on myself, and I can give myself a break sometimes. And every single one of you have the opportunity to have that space in your life. And I gotta let you know that this is the most valuable space of mine. That that hour a week that I go to sit down with someone, um, and all we do is talk about me, that's the highlight of my week. I love talking about me. And she has to listen, it's her job. Um, and so you have the ability to do that, to go find that person in this school who can hear you out and you can talk through that stuff on and they're not gonna have the opinions that everyone else in your life does and that can, is so freeing. I love my parents to death, but every time I talk to them, they wanna know, oh, well, you know, what's your job? How are you, how are you, when are you gonna get married? Like sometimes they just don't give me the feedback that I need from them. They're a little <coughs> overbearing still. My friends are amazing, I have amazing friends. They haven't been through the stuff I've been through. So they can't always give me advice on the stuff that I need advice on. But this therapist has devoted her life to helping me help me. And she, for that hour a week, I get to sit in that room and I get to be real. And I need you, and we don't even talk about my diagnosis, and I need to stress that for you. Because that space is available to you whether you have a diagnosis or not. And the reason that I think that space is so uh, important to me is because it, I've changed what asking for help means in my life. I, my whole life, up until recovery, I thought asking for help was a sign of weakness. I thought if you could not do it yourself, that was a sign of weak character, and I did not want to have weak character. And I thought I had to figure this out on my own. And today I've learned that that is wholly untrue. That I had never dealt with anxiety before. I had never overcome an addiction before. I couldn't possibly know how to do it by myself. I had to ask somebody who knew what they were talking about. And that if I'm really honest with you, that the people who have the businesses that I want to own one day, the people who have the families that I want to have one day, I look at those people and every single one of them asks for help when they don't know what they're doing. Not because they're incapable, but because they're capable because they understand it takes a lot less heartache and a lot less headache to learn it from someone else than to try to muddle through it yourself. And so every time I walk into a therapist's office, that's an empowerment thing for me. Someone said to me, do you, just, do you think you deserve a life better than this one? And I said, yes, unequivocally yes. And they said, well then you gotta go get it. You gotta go chase that. And that made sense to me. Every time I go into a therapist's office, I'm taking action on the belief that I deserve to feel better and be better than I, do, than I am right now. And I've continued on that path for over seven years because my life continues to get better. I continue to get better at managing my emotions and my feelings. I continue to feel better about my life. I continue to have more opportunities and be able to take the stress of those opportunities only because I want and got help, not in spite of it, right? And so I want, I want you to reframe that. If you've ever thought about asking someone for help or offering your friend to go get them help and you didn't want to insult them, you didn't want to label them, to reframe it in your head for one second and know that for me, that label has been the most empowering thing in my life. The diagnosis is what will let me know that I had a solvable problem that I could overcome. And once I got that diagnosis, I got the tools and the skills that I needed to live the life and do anything that I want to do. And that has been an amazing experience that you have available to you. But that's not how I saw therapy when I showed up there that first time. And so I want to talk a little bit more about what that recovery looks like for me. Uh, because, like I said, anxiety was a respiratory infection. The things that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are things that everyone in this room is able to do because I still need to take care of my mental health. I dealt with the diagnosis, but if I don't take care of my mental health, that diagnosis might, um, you know, that crisis might come back. So the first thing I needed to do was work on positive coping. And I know that sounds really cliche. Like, what do you do to de-stress? What do you do to have fun? But I can't stress how much this is the foundation of my healthy recovery on a day-to-day -day basis. And I say this to you because I, answering this question for me has been a really cool experience because I didn't have any healthy things in my life. The only things that I did in my life were the things that I was told to do. I played the sports that my father told me to play. I was in the clubs that my teachers told me to be in. I wore the clothes and I listened to music that my friends did and I had nothing that was mine. 
And finding this thing has not only been an, an amazing like, kind of adventure for me, but it's been super freeing. And the one thing that I want to stress to you is that you do not have to be good at the things that you are passionate about. I grew up on the Jersey Shore, and uh, I love the beach. I love to surf, even though I cannot do it. I've been trying for years, and if I stand up one time, that's a big deal for me. Like, I will take a two and a half hour ride to the beach to try to stand up on that surfboard one time. But the truth is, when I'm out there, I'm not stressed about tomorrow. I'm not freaking out about what I got coming up. I'm not worried about what happened yesterday. I'm right there with the people I'm with. I'm, I'm like, I am centered and present in that moment. And that is such a healthy thing for me, even though I'm terrible at it. And there are a lot of things that I'm really good at in my life that I hate doing, that I do because I have to for work or to maintain relationships, but I don't have to be passionate about it. And I say that to you because you can be great in some things, but you don't have to be passionate about those things if you don't want to. If you love to draw and all you draw is stick figures, that's your thing. Do not let people hate on that. Because this is, I cannot stress how important this is for my daily recovery. And when you answer this question, it can show you interesting things about yourself, too. Now, I want to talk about specifically things I had to do to deal with my anxiety, right? Some of the targeted treatment. For me, I learned a lot about my anxiety. My anxiety sneaks up, takes me over. That I feel that anxiety creeping up on me, I start to obsess about the fact that it's creeping up on me. That obsession creates more anxiety, and it spirals into a panic attack. So what I had to do was focus on something other than the anxiety so I could get through that moment instead of being taken over by it. And I learned with a the therapist how to do that through breathing exercises. Different, different skills work for different people, but I would take these deep breaths, I would focus on the breathing instead of focusing on the anxiety, and it got me through some of the hardest moments in my life. And even though I felt like it was silly when we started, it worked. But then I started doing this, and I realized the time that I'm most anxious is when I'm up in front of a group of strangers talking about stuff that isn't easy to talk about. And I realized that I would you know, feel that anxiety creeping up on me here and I couldn't use my coping skill. I can't just freeze and start. It gets really weird really fast, right? Um, and so I said to my therapist, like, help me. <laughs> the time that I need my coping skill, it doesn't work. And but she doesn't help me, she helps me help me. And so she said, well, what else can we focus on? And we thought about it, we thought about it, and we realized that it was not abnormal for a speaker to hold a bottle of water. And so if you go on our Twitter, if you go on our Facebook, for the first year that I did this, I could not speak without a bottle of water in my hand. And in her office, we practiced it. What did it feel like? What was the weight? What sounds did it make? What was, how did the plastic feel in my hand? And that's what I would focus on instead of the breathing. And it sounded wild. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how does a water bottle help with anxiety? It didn't make any sense to me. It felt like witchcraft. And I was like, I don't, I hope you know what you're talking about because this sounds really silly. But you know what, it worked. Just like the breathing, just like the water bottle, those skills got me through some of the hardest moments in my life because I know today that it's not about the breathing. It's not about the water bottle. This was a mental exercise that I was being taught. And I was using the breathing and the water bottle as tools, and today I don't need those tools anymore. That if I get anxious, if I get overwhelmed, I can do the exercise in my head and uh, without the breathing, without the water bottle, and I get through those anxious moments instead of being taken over by it. And just like someone who wears a cast, eventually gets strong enough that that cast comes off, that's how positive coping skills work in my life. I started taking things off the bottom of the pile, and as that pile got smaller, those problems got more manageable. And today, that pile doesn't feel so big, and I have control over my life today. And because of that, I've been able to do all the things that people told me I would do. I'll build mine in your mind um, you know, in a really big way. I've been working here for like four years and I have a full-time position helping manage uh, where the organization goes on a national level. I started a business that helps college students uh, at Drexel University. It's a, it's a sober housing uh, place for people who want to go to college but need a sober place to live with a supportive environment community. All these things that people told me I'd do one day, 
I was able to do, but only because I got the diagnosis and I got the help for it. And these tools have allowed me to live the life that I wanted to live one day. And I need you to hear that. That for me, the thing that I ran from for so much of my life because I thought that label would affect my life forever, it did affect my life forever, but not in the way that I thought. And so I want to um, talk about, real quick, in the interest of time, these are things I had to accept because for me, anxiety was something that I was uh, gonna, it was gonna happen. I, I had a family that has it genetically. I, had a, I lived in a home that was not consistent and that there was a lot of fighting. All of those things are confluence of factors that are gonna lead to anxiety. But what set it over the top was the words that ran in my head over and over and over. And they centered around these three ideas. I needed to be perfect. If I was not perfect, if there was a crack in that armor, that you would see what was on the inside, and I hated what was on the inside. And so I could never be stressed. I always had to know what to do, and I could make zero mistakes. And I gotta tell you that those three things are impossible. And if that's what you're attempting to do, that that's gonna be overwhelming. Because I, for myself and for many others, this is an overwhelming proposition. But it's okay to not know what to do. This is, you, you know, you filled out your first college application, you got your first job, you moved to a new city for the first time. Like, these are things that have happened to you recently or are about to happen, and they're stressful. And you're not supposed to know what to do because you've never done it before. So reach out and ask someone for help. I have friends that are Division I athletes that have been playing the sports that they play for decades, still have a coach. They've been playing for 15 years, they are the best at what they do, and they still ask somebody for help each and every day. And whenever I look at that, I go, why don't I have a coach for everything in my life? Why are we so afraid to ask for help when um, in some areas of our life, when we're so, it's so easy to do in other areas? I've been in recovery for seven years. Am I better? I guess so, right? I, my life is enormously different than it was previously. But I continue to get results because I continue to reach out for help in the same way that that Division I athlete still talks to their coach because they know they're great today, but that they can still be better. And so if you can accept these things in your life, you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache. All of these things need to be uh, acceptable. The only thing that for me is unacceptable is having no one that you talk to this stuff about. That that secret that I carried was the heaviest weight that I ever had to bear, and you might know what that feels like. And if you know what that loneliness feels like, I don't think that any one person can shoulder that, so you have to share this stuff with someone else. And so I'm gonna close by talking about why I do this, right? Why do I get up in front of a group of strangers and talk about stuff that honestly isn't easy to talk about? The reality is this was supposed to be a secret. You were never gonna know about it. I was gonna get help, I was gonna get back on track, and no one was ever gonna hear about my struggle with anxiety or my struggle with drugs and alcohol, but then somebody challenged me to go help somebody who's going through what I, what I just went through. And so I did that early in my recovery. Found people in early sobriety who were struggling with their, their mental health, and I told them what my therapist told me, that you're not alone, it gets better, and I'm gonna be here until you believe that. And I watched that little bit of hope help that person get through their worst day. And when the part of me that I hated helped someone get through their worst day, I stopped hating that part of me. And it redefined what that experience meant for me. And all that pain and all that shame and all that stigma faded away because it had a purpose. And you have the ability to do that in your life too. You don't need to have to relate with my struggle with mental health or with drugs and alcohol. Everyone in here has some stuff that you carry around that you don't let people see. Because we're taught, we're taught to put up walls and when people ask how we're doing, we're like, I'm fine, I'm good, I got this. When we're really thinking I'm the only one who knows how bad it feels to get my heart broken like this. Or I'm the only one who knows how bad it feels to go home and listen to my parents fight like that. When the reality is you sit next to people every day who know what you're struggling through and they would love someone to talk to about it. So if you can find the courage to keep an eye out for those people and let them know that simple idea that it gets better and you're not alone, that little bit of hope is gonna change the way that person feels about that part of their life. 
And I can guarantee it'll change the way that you feel about that stuff that you've been through. Because no one has an easy go here. We're all gonna struggle, we all fall short. Life can be painful, but we have a choice in those moments on what we do with it. And, um, and I'm not gonna carry that pain alone, I'm gonna use it to help someone else not have to hurt as bad. And when you do that, it will change the way that experience uh, is written in your life. And that's been a really freeing experience for me. But if you do relate with the things that I struggle with, right? Go get out. Everything you need is right here in the school. I don't care what your first step is. But you don't have to go through any more pain. You don't have to experience any more consequences before you qualify to feel better. If you don't like the way where you're going through right now, reach out. That first step is scary. I know that you, you want to look at the whole thing and go, well, this has to happen, and this has to happen, and this has to happen, and that feels overwhelming. Don't sweat any of that. Take the first step. Reach out to a friend, a family, a teacher, a counselor. Whatever that first step you're comfortable with is, take that step today. And then you can figure out what the next step is after that. But don't worry about the whole journey. Just worry about that first step. If you have a friend who's struggling, help them get help. I know it feels overwhelming, right? Mental health crisis, suicide ideation, drug and alcohol abuse. How do we fix that? Well, as your friend, as a friend, it's not your job to fix it. There are professionals who know how to help people get out of crisis, and you don't need to get those roles con like confused. As a friend, your only job is to be a friend, to let them know, hey, I'm not alone, uh, you're not alone, I'm here with you, I care, and I'm not leaving until we figure out what that next step is. I'm somebody who has all the suicide prevention and drug and alcohol education certifications that I can get, and I still, when there's somebody that I truly care about, comes to me in crisis, don't always have the right answer for them because it's not my job to always have the answers. But what I tell them is, listen, I, you know, I love you, man, and I'm not hanging up this phone until we figure this thing out. And that's all you need to do is let people know you care and that you're willing to help figure it out with them. Because as a job, as a friend, that's your only job. And the last thing I'll say is, if you have friends that are struggling, and, uh, and they won't go get help, you gotta go help for them. And I would have said that when I was your age. I was afraid people would be upset with me, that they'd be angry with me. But the truth is I can't count on one hand how many friends I lost that made all the same decisions around drugs and alcohol that I did. And uh, I can't get them help anymore. They're, I watch their parents get up and tell their stories for them because they're not with us. And if I, when I think about that, every single time, if I could run that back, I would risk that friendship to save that friend. I'd give anything to give them the opportunity of the life of recovery that I have today. And so if you have someone who's struggling, it's, it's a life or death matter, and they deserve a life of recovery. So be the friend to say something, even if they don't want you to, because the, the consequences are too high, the risk is too high. And the fact is, to the people who saved my life, to the people who cared about me when I wasn't even ready to care about me, those are my closest friends today. They gave me a life that I didn't know was possible. And you can be that friend for someone else. And I was a little bit angry in the beginning because someone ripped off that mask that I thought no one should see behind. And so that situation might happen, but that pain was temporary because ripping off that mask let the problem be seen for what it was. And when the problem was seen, we could solve it. And that was a one of the most important experiences I've ever had in my life, and you can be that friend for someone else, and I implore you to do that, because uh, someone was that friend for me. You guys have been an awesome audience. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. for eight more minutes, I think it's doable, because I can't hear questions if other people are talking. So please help me out. So who wants to ask the first question of me, about minding your mind, about drugs and alcohol, about mental health? Yes. During your recovery, did you ever consider reusing again? Yes, yeah, so um, during my time in recovery, 
Was there ever a time that like relapse was on the table? The fact is, for a lot of people, uh, relapse is, is part of their story. Uh, it's not a requirement. I will say that my road to recovery was not linear. Um, since October 25th, 2009, I've had continuous sobriety. But I've won it. Uh, it tempted me. Because the truth was, is that as bad as I knew drugs and alcohol were for me, it was something I had done every day for years, and I was comfortable with it. I knew that it was painful, but it was familiar. And the scary part about recovery is I was doing this brand new thing that people promised me would feel better, but I didn't know anything about it. And new things are scary for people. But if you're in that situation, you gotta trust that what someone's gonna give you is better than what you had, and I had that trust. I kept people in my life that I did trust. And so for me, relapse was not part of the story, but temptation was a real thing. But now, you know, if I'm honest with you, seven years later, temptation is not much of a thing. Like, I'm 28 years old, um, my friends can legally drink, uh, I go watch football games at bars, I go to concerts where there's alcohol, my friends get married, they have open bars, and that alcohol does not scare me. Um, some of my friends like to have a couple of drinks to like hang out and have fun, and as adults, like who have emotional frameworks and have finished their brain development, they're allowed to do that. I'm not gonna judge them. But I'm comfortable with who I am. I'm completely, I'm comfortable enough to get up in front of you and share this stuff. So when I go to a party, when I go to a club, when I go to a concert, I don't need a couple of drinks to relax because I'm already comfortable with who I am. And that's a choice that I get to make today. And that's why temptation is not a super big deal right now. But that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. How do you tell people who like you know how you went to like rehab and you meet people? Have you met a person who went to went to a different path than you, but they didn't like succeed? And if you know these people, did they inspire you to keep going? So um, I did, I have met people, um, actually I, there's, you know, the question is, do I know people that I started this path with um, that they didn't, you know, succeed and did that help keep me going? And it's a, it's a mixed feeling, you know, I had this, uh, uh, my, my friend Matt, I won't say his last name out of respect for him, but uh, lived here locally, brilliant kid, early in my recovery, he was the first person I hung out with that I actually had fun with. I remember saying that this guy actually convinced me that I can have a life one day in sobriety. Um, and he relapsed and he died of an overdose last year. And that was heartbreaking for me because he is one of the main reasons that I'm able to stand up here today and have the life that I have. Um, so it's a mixed bag. Like, I wouldn't say that inspires me. It, it keeps it real. I know that for me, relapses are dangerous. That I've built those pathways in my brain. If I pick back up, they light back up, and I'm gonna go right back to where I was, and I might not be as lucky this time. So it keeps it real for me, um, but it's also heartbreaking, because like addiction is still a real thing, and a lot of people uh, don't get it, and that's why I'm all about prevention. I try to talk to people as early as possible, because the sooner you decide to stop taking steps in that direction, the easier it is to get help. Every step you take down that path, it's three steps to get back. So if you've, if you've veered off the path a little, made, made some decisions because of peer pressure or curiosity, like I'm not condemning you. We all, like, that's a journey that people go down. But you don't have to continue to down that path. I want to empower you to say enough is enough and I'm not going to make any more of these decisions like that because I know today where they can lead and I don't want to go there again. So that, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, over there. That's a great question. So like, what are some of the signs? Um, I wish there was like a really concrete answer to that. But a good rule of thumb is if, if, it, if you feel it in your gut, ask a question about it. The things you should be looking out for are changes in behavior. They, there's something they used to love to do, they don't do that anymore, ask them about it. If all of a sudden they're eating a lot more, they're eating a lot less. They seem to be sleeping all the time, or you think they're not sleeping at all, you're just getting texts from them like, Snapchats three in the morning, every night, right? Maybe they're just like being a teenager, right? That's totally normal teen behavior. But it also could be something deeper, and so you gotta ask them about it. Because when you see all that stuff happening together, listen, 
Somebody might have loved to dance, and then all of a sudden they're in junior year and they're like, whatever, I don't want to dance anymore. That's not a huge deal, but it could be something. And so as a friend, talk to them about it. Ask those questions to learn more. Say, oh, I thought you loved that. What happened? Let them explain it a little bit more to you, and they'll tell you. But what you need to do is identify yourself as a safe person. And the way you do that is when you see those little red flags, those little changes in behavior, you talk about it, and they're going to give you more information. And at the very least, you open the door to say, hey, I'm somebody who notices things about you, and I care enough to ask. So if you don't want to talk about it today, that's fine. But if you ever do want to talk about it, I'm here, so come talk to me. Um, and that's what I would kind of recommend you do. Um, time, right? Okay, one more. If there is one. I can't see, oh, right there? Go ahead. Yes, so uh, that is an incredibly complicated last question, but I love to answer it. So to give a summary of what the question was, what, how do I feel about harm reduction strategies? And harm reduction strategies, the example that was mentioned are clean needle exchanges, which are supposed to give people clean needles so that we stop the spread of some of these life-threatening diseases that come from people reusing or sharing needles. But harm reduction doesn't just look like that. For some people, uh, it could mean if you're using uh, heroin, now we're just gonna try to use alcohol, and then we're gonna sh just use cigarettes, and then we're gonna try to stop it all together. And so harm reduction can be a process where people take steps towards where they wanna be, and they don't have to take one big leap, because sometimes that leap uh, can be really big. Now, the needle exchange specifically, we would have to have a really long conversation. They're complicated issues. But I do believe that any steps we can take to help not make it worse, it's not a step in the right direction, but it's not a step backwards. And the lesson that I take with that in my friendships is I don't always have to be driving people to be perfect in their life. But sometimes, just figuring out how today, let's not take any more steps backwards, is a step forwards, right? Some days the best thing I can say in my recovery is I didn't take any more steps back today. And that's not a great answer, but it's progress, right? So I think that with the help of a professional, putting together a harm reduction strategy so that your recovery is manageable and in steps is totally a good idea. But it does get to some complicated issues where um, I have a lot of opinions, but it's kind of hard to answer them um, you know, from a, a place like this. But the fact that you're thinking about it is important. I think as a community, we need to have discussions around those issues because we all get a vote when it comes to what we want to see in our community. Um, you guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much. For Everybody just have a seat for a second. Have a seat, Max. Thank you. Let's give another big hand for Carl. Another big hand. We're going to uh, dismiss the juniors first. Senior tour guide, step.